Speaker Public Speaking Competition for 2022. We have three excellent speakers and speeches lined up for you this afternoon. Uh, the speakers for the, our judges say in the, uh, will be speaking in this order. Uh, we've got Sophia Father Daniel going first, we've got Marguerite Rutman going second, and Jack Saunders going third. Uh, thank you to our three judges for giving up their time to be here. Uh, speakers, please take note that our judges are right throughout the hall, so you will need to make sure you project. Uh, the speakers have permission to remove their masks for their speech, so please be mindful of that. And if I could ask you to now just take a moment to make sure your phone is on silent, so that it will not disturb any of the speakers during the final. To our three judges, a uh, reminder that there is no set uh, rubric. Uh, this is simply your own uh, adjudication of the speeches. Uh, take into account the both content and delivery while you are judging. And um, once the all three speakers have spoken, I'll ask that everyone leave and the three judges will stay behind for a quick chat to see if we can't find our winner. Uh, to our three speakers, thank you again for giving up your time in preparation so close to exams to share your thoughts with us. And best luck all three of you. We will get started today. I see the uniformed officer scratching through the evidence in the river, only to come across a bloody shoe and a pinky finger. The forensic diver goes to the side, and Roach Evans strikes again, and the TV screen goes black. We would all be scarred if we saw something like this in real life. But how many of us have sat watching this exact type of scenario unfold, glued to the TV? Is it normal to find such horror so compelling when you're watching it through a screen? Why does something so unsettling and troubling draw me in? I began doing some research and started wondering, am I alone in feeling this way? The answer is no. There are millions of true crime fans out there. But while researching them, I discovered a fascinating statistic. 85% of true crime fans are women. 85%, that is insanely high. And the psychology behind why more women than men love true crime is even more fascinating. So there were a few reasons for this. The first reason traces back to the psychological differences between men and women, namely the fact that women have more than ability to empathize. When you're watching something and you empathize with the victim or explore the mind of the case, it makes it much more compelling. Basically boiling it down to a simple desire for a good old-fashioned gripping entertainment. A sort of who walks his thinking. Did he realize this? Does he regret what he did? The higher levels of empathy trigger our curiosity. This leads to a hunger for more detail. What happened in the end? Is the killing a thought? What was the sentence? This makes us more engaged with the story of the world. The next reason is one that resonates with me the most. True crime means an out of the female rage. Everyone is raging inside them. But society views it as unfeminine for a woman to express her anger. Meanwhile, it is totally acceptable for men to. There are even various activities that allow for men to release pent up rage. These are things such as violent video games, contact sports, or perhaps even street fighting. Now, these activities are not reserved only for men, but are highly male dominated even today. Meanwhile, there are relatively few outlets for female rage. P.E. Mossberg's in Mother Jones writes, a woman's fear and anger can be powerful things. That's the virtue of true crime. No other genre gets that cool, nagging feeling that most, if not all, women harbor. That everything is fine. Probably, but might also not be. I might be murdered just for existing. In other words, it has been suggested that perhaps true crime allows a woman to tap into channels of rage that have been suppressed or even channels of fear, but most likely a combination of both. The next reason is that women in general live in constant fear of violence from men. And this is where subconscious comfort comes into play. And I mean very subconscious. Women can feel calm watching these stories, as they feel as though they might learn what to do if they were in that situation, or what the killer is looking for, or how the woman managed to escape. True crime has been described as somewhat of a dress rehearsal for women who feel they could be in that situation. Unfortunately, this reason is all too relatable, especially to that time, where so many women experience violence or live in fear of it. But perhaps the most soothing part of episode, documentary, or podcast would be the end, that satisfying moment when the killer is caught and convicted. This ties into the next reason, which is the desire for justice. In a chaotic and cruel world, it can be nice to every now and then 
see the justice system, which is a very important system, but then it's purpose. Kind of a, aha, screw you, you get what you deserve type of satisfaction. As well as just a reminder that the justice system can work and justice can be served. So tonight, if you find yourself taking twisted pleasure in someone's on-screen murder, don't feel guilty. Remember, it is just human nature with a pinch of woman's intuition. It is even okay to be excited in season two. Thank you. about people, 
It's only when we choose to care that we really learn about ourselves. You also start to get to know your own mind a little better. You have a lot of time to think. Trust me, I have had some of my best thoughts in front of the, the piano. In fact, half of the speech was written in front of the piano. You also start to appreciate how influential your thoughts are over, over your actions and the realities you perceive. If my first impression of a section was that it was impossibly difficult, I'll find it difficult whether it actually is or not. But if I believe myself capable, I can suddenly play it. As James Allen says, a person is limited only by the thoughts they choose. This plays into the art of accepting and believing praise. This was, whew, this was very hard. <laughs> because you've hopefully infused a little piece of yourself into the performance, it can be so easy to be critical. You have heard this piece over and over. You know exactly what it should sound like, what the exact placement of every note should be. It's only natural. But part of the hard work is accepting and believing praise and offering it to yourself as well. Otherwise, how can you really appreciate what you're doing or how far you've come? But what does success and accomplishment actually look like? The first thing I had to learn was that it's never going to be perfect. Sometimes you do everything you can and you still don't get it right. I don't have, it is what it is, I don't have Gershman's inhumanly large hands or Beethoven's technical skill. On really cold days, I warm my hands up under the tap instead of spending 20 plus minutes playing scales. I am only what I am, and I can only do my best. The absolute worst thing you can do in a performance is to fixate on the mistakes. Well, no, the worst thing you can do is stopping. But the point is, just keep going. Put a big, fat, fake smile on your face and pretend that that is exactly how Bach intended it to be. Because trust me, it's never as bad as bad as it seems in that moment. The funny thing about music is that a piece is only notes. It's your job to make it music. Give it a little piece of yourself. Infuse it with love. That is what an audience will remember. Not the mistakes. At times when lockdown hit me hardest, my days became sparse, but for religiously practicing piano every day. And while I doubt that piano will ever be my be-all and end-all, I have struggled from very early on to imagine a world without it. There is always more to learn. And that's why I wish today to everyone in this audience is that you will find something that will do for you what piano has done for me. That you will find something to devote yourself to. not at all unique. Shyness. Near debilitating shyness. And I want to talk about the thing that finally helped me start building confidence. This. Public speaking. Now, I've had the idea of talking about this for ages, but I never did because, I mean, come on, I'm the person that goes and does those stupid guild announcements who's always on and on about tutoring in front of the whole school. I don't come across as someone who's shy. And maybe you assumed that I'd never been shy. I liked that assumption. I never wanted to break it. But if we're to believe that study that Mr. Brown found about how some people fear public speaking more than death, well, I think I should probably explain why it seems like I have a death wish. Confidence. It was never really one of my strengths. I have countless memories in my childhood of slowly backing away from others, with my parents softly reassuring them that, oh no, don't worry about him, he's just shy. They were never wrong. I've always been more introverted, and I never minded that. But my sheer fear and inability to deal with the smallest of social interactions started to become a problem as I grew up, and yet was still incapable of talking to a waiter at a restaurant, or a store clerk, or a friend's friend I just been introduced to, or any number of small so social exchange that many people don't even think about. To this day, I don't know why I couldn't handle any of these things. 
I would just start to feel anxious, then a little bit queasy, then like I was slowly sinking down into the ground. It's a little bit like reverse narcissism, if you will. Where narcissists think that everyone's always looking at how great they are, I felt like everyone was looking at me too, but rather that they were looking at everything wrong with me. Now, I knew really that this wasn't actually true, but I could never shake the feeling. Because of that, I never had the confidence to even try to overcome it. As a result, I became pretty lonely as I missed out on a lot of social relationships and experiences. So, shy, lonely me, there's not a chance you would have engaged with public speaking had it not been mandatory in school. But it is, so I had to find a way to get through it, whether I liked it or not. Luckily, I already love writing, and what's also lucky is that I know that with enough practice, you can memorize pretty much anything. So, all I had left to do was to actually get up and start speaking. So, why was I forgetting which line came next? Why was my mind going blank? Why are my hands shaking? Why was my voice quivering? And why did all of this have to be happening when everyone in the room was staring at me? And then, something clicked. You see, while public speakers can make a speech feel casual and informal, this isn't really a conversation, is it? No, because if it was, I'm guessing you would have replied by now. It's a monologue, from Greek mono logos, speaking alone. Through public speaking, all of my fears of talking to other people, they could be planned for, prepared for. Well, yeah, maybe I couldn't be the most confident person in normal everyday life with two-way conversations, with public speaking, I could practice it. And with that one realization, everything changed. You see, the person that's talking to you all right now isn't really me. It's more of a facade, one that I've created and then rehearsed. How can I show you? Well, it's actually quite easy. I can prove it to you by the fact that pretty much nothing about this changes, whether I'm talking to all of you or to an empty, lifeless wall. Voice projection, gesticulation, positioning, all of these things can be learned, and confidence itself can be simulated. And I did start to experience some benefits. Slowly but surely, I started to realize that maybe talking to people wasn't such a terrible thing and wouldn't result in some horrible humiliation every time I tried it. So, Gradually, I did start to grow in confidence, but I still didn't feel like it was the real me. Then, an excellent public speaker and an admirable person once told me that my words could have power. And that was the final piece of the puzzle for me. I finally realized that it's not about this persona I'm presenting, it was about the words I'm saying. Now, that sounds obvious, right? But that is why I love public speaking. So, get it out of your head, this idea that public speaking is about being confident. Because it's not. It's about sharing an idea that you believe in. The mechanics, they can all be learned. I am living proof of that. There's not a single person here that doesn't have something worthwhile to share. And you don't need to be confident to share those ideas. Because when you talk about something that you truly believe in, that is not. Thank you to the Speaker Circle Committee for putting this together and enjoy the rest of your break.